for a hot deal. <laughs> we, we, we talked today. What's that? We talked today. Right. I gave her my attention. The time now. Hey, how you doing? It's good to see you. Man. Talk to Lane. What's that? Are you ready? The mayor. She still wants to do this, right? Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Oviedo City Council Chambers. Um, will everybody please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? We have a couple of scouts over here that will come up and uh, lead us in that. Coleman, would you like to lead us in the invocation? Good evening, Council. If you would like to pray with me, if you would please bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight, uh, as we do usually twice a month, uh, to uh, do the business of the city. That This Council, we ask for your blessing upon them, their wisdom, to direct them and guide them, uh, to be able to reach out and 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 understand what the needs of the city are. We ask that you protect them and their families on the way to and from uh, this, this meeting, as well as everybody in the congregation, in, the, in this building, as well as watching online. We ask you for all these things in your name. Amen. Okay, I'd like to call the meeting to order. It's Monday, January 6th at approximately 6.30 p.m. We have all the members of council present. So our, our uh, first items of business are a couple ceremonial items. So if we could just go and join the mayor um, down below and do this. Thinking about there now we're on delayed reaction. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. Uh, I could not be a happier camper to know that we've got two sets of state championship swimming teams uh, in, right here in our midst. Uh, both the, both the boys and the girls had an undefeated season here. Could we give them a round of applause, real quick? Uh, that's that is a first here in Oviedo. And coaching them this year was, and in many years past, is Coach Charlie Rose. If you could come on up and introduce us, tell us a little bit about the team, and introduce all, all of the swimmers. All right, so I'm Coach Charlie. Is Coach Eric here? Anyone know? He couldn't. Okay, so one of the assistant coaches with me is Coach Eric. I just want to introduce him. But, um, yeah, it's an honor for me to be up here. These kids are amazing. I'm going to call them up first, and we're going to go over some of the things that they've done. Uh, starting with the girls, Carly Rose. Gabby Goodwin, and you guys can just line up, I guess, across here. Gabby Donahue, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, shake hands. <laughs> Ellie Rothfuss, Brookie Brennan, Kaylin Herbett, Abby Gibbons, Sarah Beth Cathcart, our three divers who I do not believe are here, Caroline Balkinate. Molly Connell and Alexis Bukorski, Jaden, Jaden Herbet, Izzy Bishop, Gabby Cartagena, Sophie Hampson, Marin Rose, Taylor Floyd. And those are the girls. And for the guys, Ryan Gibbons, Ryan Reynolds, Luca Oliva, Patrick Fry, Josh Howell, Carson Powers, our diver, Mason Herbet, Tyler Hanley, Justin Rockaway, Carter Anderson, and Lucas Boaz.
So as as the mayor as the mayor mentioned before, um, these guys and girls went undefeated the entire season. Every dual meet, every invitational conference, districts, regions, and state undefeated the entire way. And that's the first time that I've ever in 25 years of being here heard of a team doing that in Seminole County or Orange County for that matter. You guys want to spread out? Um, okay. The, this year's team, they uh, on the girls' side, they broke 10 out of 11 school records. On the boys' side, they broke 7 out of 11. Um, I'm just so incredibly proud of these guys and girls. I cannot even tell you guys how much. I know their parents are, too. They're great students, incredible students, great kids. Um, you know, to get to this level, it takes two to three hours a day before school and after school. And then in the summer times, they're doing four to six hours a day. Um, and it's, it's just an incredible amount of work. They uh, also, I'd like to just mention if they could want to raise their hand or something. Uh, state champions, we have Gabby Donahue in the 100 back, and these are these are individual state champions. And then in the 200 medley relay, girls: Gabby Donahue, Sarah Beth Cathcart, Abby Gibbons, and Kaylin Herbet. <laughs> On the 200 free relay, Abby Gibbons, Jaden Herbet, Kaylin Herbet, and Izzy Bishop. And then for the 400 free, Sarah Beth Cathcart, Gabby Donahue, Izzy Bishop, and Jaden Herbet. <laughs> and just for the record, it's the first time well, since 1995 in swimming when both men's and women's team have won the state championships. It's the first time since 1995, Dr. Phillips, so quite an accomplishment. And that's really, that's, that's really all that I have to say, mostly about these kids. Um, I, I can't. I'm not going to be up here all day. They're incredible. I do want to say uh, one mention one thing that about 18 years ago I sat with her father in this building and many other people in this room, and we talked about building a pool and a facility and their vision for the city and a vision for the youth and what we can do. And I just wish your dad could see this because or maybe he is. But um, I, I, it's just I, I know that this city council this has a lot to do with you guys as well as these other sports and what you guys provide. So we say thank you, all the kids and parents say thank you guys for what you've done for us for the last 20 years, and we look forward to another 20 years of support from you all. So thank you very much. I, I just have one question, Charlie. How long have you been doing this? I've known you 14, 15 years. 25 years. Let's give this guy a big round of applause. <laughs> Guys like Charlie make the city really special. Well done, everyone. Congratulations. 25, 25 years. <laughs> All right, it's not just the swimmers who have had an amazing year. Haggerty High School's girls volleyball team. Uh, what a season. I uh, want to bring up Juanita Hitt, the head coach, to talk about the great season these girls have had. Is, is she here? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for having us. We are so excited to be here. I'm going to introduce some of our players and talk a little bit about them. So our first um, player is senior setter Madison Coates. 
She will be going on to play at Bethune-Cookman University. We have Kylo Mullen, Junior Setter. Emily Lawrence, also a senior setter who will go on to play at the University of Central Florida. We have Alondra Garcia, junior libero. Samantha Smith, senior right side outside hitter. Jessica Baez, senior outside hitter who will be going on to play at the University of North Florida. Senior middle blocker, Niasha Mafaracizi, and I always mispronounce her name, I apologize. Freshman, Brooke Stevens. And in the back, we have my voluntold husband, um, coach, and our athletic director, Jay Getty. Um, we also have a few players that could not be here. Um, two of our seniors, Sydney Conley, who is attending class right now at Florida State University, who will be playing at FSU. Senior Audrey Douglas, who will be is, uh, taking class on Wednesday at Auburn University. And we had two other players who are at practice, Olivia Price, Jr., and Alina Carrillo, Jr. So thank you for all having us. Uh, Drew and I, we were talking that, um, raise your hand, girls, those of you that have played at Oviedo Rec. So quite a bit of them grew up playing at the Oviedo Recreation Center. So we appreciate that, and we're lucky to have that in our community. These girls went out to Phoenix, Arizona, one of the top um, tournaments in the country at the Nike Tournament of Champions, and placed seventh out of 100 teams. Um, it was the highest finish of any Florida school in, for, in history. So they did an amazing job, and uh, we're so proud of them. And they're not only fantastic volleyball players, but they're phenomenal women, young women, and very smart and brilliant, and you can see they're very beautiful. So we're, we love them. And I think every last one of y'all is at least three or four inches taller than me. Probably more like six. <laughs> All right, thank you again, and congratulations. I put Novito on the map, for, and for all of Florida, too, so that's awesome. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes. Um, what's the pleasure of council? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Ms. Madam Mayor. I move we approve the minutes. Second. All right. Um, is there any uh, discussion? All right. Hearing none, I'd like to take the vote. All those in, um, in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Nope. Motion carries. All right. This is the uh, portion of the uh, the meeting where we have our public comments, and um, I've got three uh, requests to speak. Um, the first one is 
uh, Mr. John Horvath. Good evening, Mayor, Council people. Um, John Horvath, 1004 Bradford Drive, Winter Park, Florida. That's a Seminole County Park with the Winter Park address. So I live in Seminole. I'm going to talk on, you're going to do a proclamation for the 2020 Census. We, I'm a member of the Seminole County Complete Count Committee and Vice Chairman. Our Chairman Phil's here. He's going to speak later. Uh, we, want, we want to thank you for your participation. We already had a meeting here with the committee. I want to tell people how important it is, but let me give you a couple of facts. 1950, the population of Seminole County, the entire population, was 25,000 people. Tonight, I just asked your city manager, what's the population of the city of Oviedo? He said 40,000. So just think, you've taken the 25,000 that were in the county in 1950, put them all here and added a few more people. You had the two schools here. The school system has 67,000 students, so we're dealing with a lot of numbers. And what we're trying to do with the Complete Count Committee, your, your city's involved, you're, you're going to put information in your newsletters and your mailers for utility, et cetera, let people know that this is important because this is money that the federal government will send to us to help us with roads and water and sewer, et cetera. And, and also, I was reading today, we're probably guaranteed for the state of Florida two more representatives in Congress and maybe a third depending on the population figure. So this is how important this 2020 census is, the Complete Count Committee. So your names can't be used for anything but the complete count of your how many in your household. The, any other agency cannot touch this information for 72 years. So it's safe and you need to sign it in. I don't know what Phil's going to talk about, but there's several ways to get this complete count in. And I'm just saying we need it because, as you all know, we're growing. I mean, like I said, I was born and raised here. My family was in the grow business, so I know what this area looked like 35 years ago when no traffic and everything. But, you know, I, have, I live with the traffic now, but we need this information to get the money from the federal government that is set up the way the system is to send it here to the people of Florida and our residents here, not only in Oviedo, but the other cities in the county and the school board. Thank you, people. Thank you. Okay, the uh, next form is uh, Philip Caprell. <laughs> Just state your name and address for the record. Philip Capro, 1005 Antelope Trail, Winter Springs, Florida, 32708. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Appreciate you having us out this evening. Um, I really appreciate you putting the census on the agenda. All these people came out to support it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and that's really important because they understand that the census is all about determining how many dollars come into our local community. And I, I'm really happy to say that you all here in the city of Oviedo, assuming you approve the, the, the <clears throat> um, resolution proclamation this evening, will be the first city in Seminole County to do such, take such action. Uh, I have all kinds of meetings over the next several weeks, but you all will be the first, um, much to the chagrin of our friends to the west. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for that. Um, John, my vice chair, you know, comes out, and a lot of times he and I split up where we go, but we decided that it was important for us to both be here because we really appreciate the efforts that you all have put in uh, to make this a thing. And as he said, you all have hosted us, and we appreciate that as well. Um, I want to use the rest of my time, actually, to shift gears and shift hats. The first part was as the uh, Census Committee Chair. The other part I had written on my sheet was to remind you all that coming up at the end of this month, uh, January 28th and 29th, the Oviedo Winter Springs Regional Chamber of Commerce uh, takes their annual trip to Tallahassee. It's the only Chamber of Commerce in Seminole County that goes up every year. And uh, you all uh, ha always send somebody with you, uh, with us, I should say. And I would be remiss if I didn't tell you how fantastic of a job Patrick Kelly has done the past couple of years for you all. Um, I understand that, that his work has translated to actual dollars coming back to the community. So it is a good return on your investment. Um, whoever it is you decide to send, we need to know soon because we are locking up for our, our hotel space. But we certainly appreciate everything that you all do for us 
And if there's anything we can ever do to be supportive for you, please just let us know. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and the last uh, form is Katrina Shaddix. Just name and address for the record, please. Do I give this to you all now to look at? Uh, yes, you could. <laughs> Katrina Shaddix, 1133 Covington Street. Excuse my casual, I was just uh, bike riding, and I've been bike riding and walking around Oviedo lately. And we have a very clean city. I'm, I'm very pleased with there's no litter anywhere. So except for right at the on-ramp at 417 where that construction is, there, right under the tree there's like 2,000 plastic water bottles. So other than that, we have a very clean city. And, um, you know, my, my mom and my uncles and my dad all went to the Oviedo High School when it was one two-story building and it was kindergarten through 12th grade. So I've been here, well, since 68, but my family since 40s, the early 40s. So we've seen a lot of change. And although Oviedo isn't the sleepy little town that we all wish it would be, it's, it's a wonderful town. And I know we're hard on y'all sometimes, but we have a very high bar for what we expect in Oviedo because it is a great town. So we want to keep it great. And which brings me to the bear in the trash issue that we have. You know, a lot of people have had bears go in their trash. And I know the contract is coming up next week to discuss who's going to be, um, whether it's Waste Pro, Republic, or whoever. Um, it's very important that y'all choose a company that will undo the straps or service bear-proof trash cans without charging residents an extra fee. Sometimes they want to charge them $60 a month or $60 a year, and uh, we don't want that. We don't want people to be resentful of the bears having to pay any extra money. And that also brings me to, I don't want any tax money spent on bear-proof trash cans. They can be 250 to $300 a piece. What do we have? How many citizens would need them? How many do we have? Five? 12,000. 12,000. That is way too much money to be spending on trash cans when we already have really good trash cans. My trash can is awesome. And to retrofit them with these bear-proof straps or bear-resistant straps, it is a little bit less than $10 a can, and they work. The bears can't get at them. Um, they're in that bag right there. So um, in case I'm not here next week when you all have the workshop for the new trash company, mm -hmm. I want to my feelings to be known. I'm going to be down in Miami protesting the Japanese embassy, so I might not be here next Monday um, because they killed dolphins and whales. But besides that, my organization can help y'all retrofit every single can in this city without using one dollar of taxes. And I would really like for y'all to consider that before doing any other contracts and spending a lot of money on that. And let me know. Y'all have my number. There's a bag. Keep the straps that are in there. We also give out the little bear whistles for people that are afraid to walk at night or run into bears. You just blow a whistle and the bears leave the... Uh, Yes. Parents hate me when I give those out at the fair. But uh, all you have to do is blow a whistle. The bears leave before you even know they're in the, the area. So super way, super easy way to live with the bears um, and, and do it inexpensively. So I hope you all consider that next Monday if that's when your committee meeting is. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. That was all the uh, uh, requests that I had. Is there anybody else wishing to speak uh, in the public hearing on items that are not in the, the public hearing section. Seeing none, I'm going to close public hearing, public comment. All right, so now moving on to public hearing. Um, our first item, let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. I've got to do the consent first. All right, so we've got the consent agenda. Hold on one second. There it is. All right. So um, the consent agenda is items five through nine. Um, what is the, oh, I'm sorry, five through, yeah, five through nine. What's the pleasure of council? Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Mayor. I move we approve the consent agenda. Second. Got a motion and a second. Uh, Madam Mayor. On item six, just want to point out to anybody who might actually be looking at the agenda that we are not vacating any right of way that would have been any use in a way that would have been useful to us. So, uh, what we have, have proposed here is 
to, because the, the awnings are sticking out over the sidewalk because there's zero foot setbacks, the best way to avoid liability was to legally give the sidewalk under those awnings and, and you know, consequently the awnings would belong to the building owners. But we have an easement to do whatever we want to on that sidewalk. So even though we're kind of giving something away, we're keeping everything useful to the citizens of Oviedo. So we're, we're all, the only thing we're giving away is the liability. Uh, and then one other one. Um, the additional funds for the plaque at Round Lake Park. If anybody opened that one up and saw that there was a, a rather expensive addition to that, and it's not that much, it's about $2,000, it's because it's made of metal. Uh, over at Round Lake Park, a, a wonderful mural is being uh, painted, uh, possibly as we speak, unless, uh, is Xavier in the, uh, okay, it's not being painted as we speak, but <laughs> this is the, he's the guy who's going to be doing it. <laughs> And uh, it, it showcases a lot of the history of the African-American community in our town. And it doesn't make nearly as much sense without a legend, without a key that sort of tells you what the different pictures depicted in this mural are. So to be meaningful and lasting and long-term, it needs to be made out of metal. So if anybody looking there, you know I'm, I'm thrifty, so I, I right away said, what, what's up with that? And that is the reason why, because we're doing something nice and permanent to go with this fantastic mural. Okay. Um, Councilwoman Smith? you have anything to add? Nothing. All right. Um, uh, I'm good. Mr. Britton, you good? I'm good. You're good? Okay. The, uh, the only other item was the uh, um, item number, um, let's see, wasn't that the, they, we had the uh, item on here for the um, census as well, right, the proclamation? Yeah, the census proclamation was also on there, um, as the other two uh, gentlemen had spoke about. So, um, anybody else have anything else? Nope. Hearing none. Yeah. Um, I uh, what's the pleasure, or I'd entertain. Let's see, we've got the motion, we got the second. Yeah. All right. So, um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Carries. Okay. All right. Item number ten. All right, um, this is a public hearing. Um, ordinance number 1689, security-related concerns and privacy matters um, which necessitate protection. Um, Mr. Groot, will you please uh, read this by um, this ordinance by title only? Yes, Mr. Deputy Mayor. An ordinance of the City of Oviedo relating to providing security for activities of the city that have security-related concerns and privacy matters which necessitate protection in the implementation of the operations, programs, projects, and activities of the city, prohibiting the making of audio recordings, video recordings, or engaging in photography of any type or nature under certain circumstances, providing for legislative findings and intent, providing for implementing administrative actions, a savings provision, conflict, severability, codification, the correction of Scribner's errors, and an effective date. And that's the ordinance by title. Thank you, Mr. Group. Mr. Cobb, can you provide a brief introduction? Uh, thank you, Mayor. As, as Mr. Group pointed out, this is an ordinance that uh, will give the city the opportunity to designate certain areas that are sensitive, have sensitive information, have sensitive personnel information to be protected. Uh, they basically to state that they are not public areas and that uh, there is a presumption of privacy within those areas. And this ordinance will set forth the legislative actions for us to be able to go throughout the different facilities of the city and to designate those areas as, as non-public. And uh, that way uh, it will provide the level of protections that we need uh, regarding those types of sensitive information. So tonight we are asking that the city council conduct a public hearing and adopt ordinance number 1689. Okay. Um uh, this is a public hearing at this time. I'll now, um, I have no written request, um, but I'll open the floor to uh, anybody wishing to speak about this item. Is there anybody wishing to speak? Seeing none, I'm going to close the... Uh, oh, we'll look oh, we do. Okay. Just name and address for the record. Uh, H. Alexander Duncan, Geneva, Florida. Um, so I, I said I'd be back for this one. If we read through the ordinance, um, first of all, Mr. Cobb here would be in charge of this ordinance. None of you guys. So if you read the ordinance, he would designate these areas. He has 
no, the people have no connection to that. You guys can be voted out of office or whatever. Mr. Cobb, when I read the ordinance, would designate these areas. That's a little troublesome to me. Um, so that's the first thing. To say any part of public property is not public, that don't even make sense. So an example would be now if you put these signs up, I could voluntarily go to talk to the police at the police station, but if I walk in the wrong hallway, I have just surrendered my right to record whatever may occur. So, and then when, when you talk about <clears throat> security related concerns, the definitions in the ordinance are so broad and it says, Mr. Cobb will determine what some of these matters are. Not y'all, not us. So, I feel like with an ordinance like this, you guys put us on a slippery slope. And if you read through the ordinance, it's all about money. It's all because a guy recorded a police chief. It's all about the city saying, you don't want to be liable if one of your citizens come in here to hold somebody accountable and wants proof of it. When we come to these meetings, there's fine print that says, if we're going to want to bring something back up, we should bring our own recording devices. And now you guys are talking about passing an ordinance to save money and avoid liability in the same regard, in the same breath. It, it doesn't even make sense. So my biggest issue with it, none against Mr. Cobb personally, I just don't like unelected officials making such big decisions on an ordinance that's uh, based solely in money, even though you guys say security concerns, you guys throw some terrorism in there. But at the beginning, it starts with money, and at the end, it ends with money. And then for you guys to let an unelected person make the decision of what areas, when, what activities, how, that these citizens will not be allowed to record, video, or anything. And that's another thing. Who then decides what's what later on? When y'all are gone, Mr. Cobb is gone, how do they interpret it? So that's what I'm going to say, and I, and I, and I just, I, I'm kind of sick to my stomach that you guys are putting this under security concerns for us, when it's really uh, security concerns for the pockets of our money. The tax dollars that you're talking about protecting is our money. So on one hand, you're going to protect our money by taking away a right to hold you guys accountable. That's all I'm saying. Okay, thank you, guys. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Anyone else? Okay, please. No, don't pause, please. Thank you. Um, state your name and address for the record. Hi, I'm Joe Toma from 924 Woodcrest Way, and I agree with Mr. Duncan. There are some parts of this that are overly broad and parts that are overly vague. One area contains an internal contradiction, and that is the part about a city employee may not record or photograph any other city employees unless directed to do so by supervisory authority. Well, now we have the supervisory authority potentially causing mischief. The potential for this to cause mischief, mischief down the road is, is great, I think. And we have no quarrel with Mr. Cobb. We think everyone on staff and all of our elected officials are acting in very good faith on this. But I, too, con uh, am concerned, along with Mr. Duncan, that who knows, in 10 or 20 years, a city manager might come along and decide that for convenience or expediency, let's just designate this area, certain areas for now, as off limits to public record. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Um, I'm going to close uh, public comment. Um, for this item and all right let's see okay what's the pleasure of council mr. chairman madam mayor 
I move we approve Ordinance 1689, but amend Section 2 to read as stated in the page that was placed on the dais at the beginning of this meeting, uh, and which is available to the public upon request. And uh, if, if anybody would be willing to second this motion, which uh, would change the word city manager to city council pretty much everywhere, because I, I agree with what, what the, uh, the, the members of the public who spoke said. Um, that's a really big decision when you start removing the right of the public to record. And we need to be willing to take a fall for it. If, if we make the wrong call, we need to go down, and y'all need to be able to tell us we've gotten it wrong. <laughs> Uh, so, I second for purposes of discussion. Um, um, I take very seriously what Mr. Thoma said and uh, Mr. Duncan, um, and um, we we have a motion to I'm second, sorry. and so it'll I'm go sorry. to the, the mayor first, and then you can. I'm sorry. Is that good? All right. Um, uh, well, it, do do we have a version of this that can go up on online or up on the big screens? And mainly the issue from my perspective was uh, section two, and I appreciate the city attorney. Uh, as soon as I read it, I said, yeah, oh, when, when we looked at it the first time, I thought, that's problematic. And when I read it a little bit closer, I thought, how can we fix this to address some real concerns on both sides? Because we can't just have people going into the water plant taking pictures. Uh, that is a legitimate a potentially legitimate place to say there's a limit to what you can videotape or, or take pictures of. Uh, but then there, there is the potential to have it be just kind of willy-nilly, let's not take pictures anywhere in City Hall. So that does need to be clarified. Um, so if you can see up there, it pretty much just crosses out City Manager and just puts in City Council. Anytime uh, a change would be made, we would be back in this room, everyone would discuss what the areas are, so, so it's you know, kind of a community decision to find what is the best balance for our city to strike to, to protect our, our water supply and other things that, that city staff may feel is important, and how do we also give maximum rights to all the citizens. Right. Councilwoman Smith? I guess I just have a question um, for city attorney if possible. Um, if we do change where it says city manager to city, um, uh, council, um, does that um, preclude the city manager from having input? No, actually the, the amendment that's drafted provides that the city manager would recommend places to sign and to implement the prohibitions and then you all would act upon his recommendations. So by changing this the only thing that's happening is that the council, another layer is being added with the council making the decision to approve what the city manager recommends? The ordinance was originally written so that the city manager would report to you those locations that he has determined to sign. Now, under the, if you approve this amendment, he would recommend to you locations to sign. You would approve or disapprove those and then based upon your action, the area would be either secured or non-secured. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilman Britton. Well, this is uh, maybe wrapping ourselves around the axle here, but uh, you know, I work for the federal government. We have areas that we have to protect for some of the same reasons here. But when I read through this, it says that uh, the case law that was referenced was that it might have uh, violated a wiretapping law because both parties didn't consent to it. Now my question is, Mr. Root, could we just put signs up saying that uh, you must uh, notify whoever you're talking to that you're recording and get consent before you do that? And then that way the decision can be made as to whether to have the conversation or not. Well, that gets to be a rather convoluted process. And uh, the, the idea is if you just put those signs, the signs that you describe would, would indicate that the area could be okay to record. And that would be the presumption. The presumption is every area in a public space is eligible to be recorded, photographed, videoed, or whatever. Okay? That's the presumption. So the, the signage would put the presumption the opposite way 
by saying that it's prohibited unless, you know, you could ask consent, I suppose. You know, if you're in HR, which is an area which has secure social security numbers, financial information, also medical information, Connie's office has a ton of stuff that if someone photographed a desk could steal somebody's identity, could have information that was, would do all sorts of mischief. Uh, so, but I don't think you want Connie's people to be in the position of being asked every time. I know that I can't do it, but do I, I know I, it's ambiguous, well, is it ambiguous that I can do it? I want to take a photograph of that particular desk. I don't think you want staff making those decisions case by case by case. You just want to have an area secure or not secure. Okay, well, that I'm just sense? reading uh, what the, the McDonough case said here, that they, they sued the guy because uh, what? all parties didn't consent to it, the secret recording. And the Well, that's right. And there was no consent. It was a secret recording. And there is a wiretape, uh, anti-wiretapping statute in Florida. And what the federal court said is that didn't matter. That didn't matter. The First Amendment rights trumped the, the wiretapping uh, statute because there was no notice that there was any expectation of privacy. There was no notice that there was any need for privacy. There was no notice that there was any security. Therefore, the presumption was anything anything goes, notwithstanding the wiretapping statute, which you know I think we can all disagree with that, and I think there's a lot of attorneys who disagree with that conclusion. But that's what the federal courts determined, and the U.S. Supreme Court decided not to review that. Okay, so I'm, I'm trying to think of examples of where this would apply. Uh, okay, this privacy go, is a HIPAA, HIPAA type inf information? Uh, well, or? here you go. Anywhere with the Social Security numbers on desk. Anywhere where there's medical information on desk. Anywhere where there's citizens' account numbers on desk, such as when utility accounts are established and the like. Um, anywhere in public works where you have water, particularly water, but water and sewer plans uh, because you don't want people to... And state law provides that those records are exempt from public records, too, because you don't want, unfortunately, in today's times, uh, potential terrorism in, in terms of injecting something in the water system. So you, don't, you want to keep the information about where those areas of the water system may or may not be vulnerable secret, basically. Uh, those are the types of areas. Uh, well, you can, go to, you can go to the police department, too, and there's all sorts of... Uh, of uh, places in the police department, I'm sure the police chief could talk about this, on, you know, on end, where you don't want people able to take photographs of potentially undercover officers, undercover officers who are coming in from a, a mission, uh, SWAT team members, uh, and not to mention the, the documents that are there. So I can keep on going, but you don't. Okay, no, I'm, I'm getting. I'm, I'm just trying to get it clear <laughs> in my head. You know, I can understand keeping the, the SCADA system secure. So do we have signs outside the door that says well, no photography, no recording whatsoever? In areas, and I think Mr. Cobb might have some ideas about particular areas, but you would be signing areas, not the overall city hall. Uh, and it would, this would have no effect on public records, by the way. So if something is a public record, it is a public record, and you can request it. The fact that you can't have ad hoc uh, authority to photograph documents on a desk doesn't mean those records, if they are public records, aren't accessible. Okay. Fair enough. So I, I guess, uh, Madam Mayor, your recommendation is simply to put it on, uh, have the recommendation come to us, and then we vote on it. I, I have no problem with that. Okay. Thank, thank you, Lonnie. Yes, sir. All right. Councilman Chudnow. Uh, just to uh, go on a little bit uh, more from Mr. Groot, especially in the police department, there is, the NCIC computers, the FCIC computers, even officers have to take a course and be certified. So to allow anybody to go in, one would have that possibility of taking the use of the NCIC, FCIC away from the police department. So that has to be secure. So to allow someone to go in and take pictures of those would not just hinder the police department, but also be a violation of state law. The only issue, so, and with the water plant and, and HR, all those things are extremely important not to get out, have that information to be out, be out in the public. Uh, as far as uh, 
these secret recordings. I'm sure almost anybody in the audience would like to know if they're being recorded. Whether it's a business deal, whether it's a conversation with your spouse, there's certain things that should remain private. And again, this isn't taking those public areas away, it's protecting items and documents and areas uh, that should remain private. Uh, as far as changing it to the city council, the only issue I might have with that is there's situations that come up that need to be acted on immediately if the police department or the fire department or the city manager gets some type of emergency notice, some type of that there's a threat, the city manager should be able to make that determination because we only meet every two weeks. So I have no issue with your amendment, but there needs to be something to allow the city manager to act in an emergency situation. Well, I might be able to help there. The idea of this ordinance is to put those who visit public facilities on notice mm -hmm. that they can't surreptitiously record, photograph, or whatever areas that are secure. If an emergency occurred such as you, you referenced, uh, let's say there was a, God forbid, a Trayvon Martin type situation in, in Oviedo, and the city manager thought that it would be good to secure a certain area and just keep it clear from the public, the media, and all that. Under the emergency powers, he, he could do that, sign or no sign. And um, so I think I think your concerns, although they're, they're well stated, I think they're, they're covered at the same time. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, because even a non-secure area, depending on what's happening in the community or what's happening nationwide, could determine that an area be a secure. Sure, this room. I mean, this room is as public as you can get, and that's good. That's the whole notion of our system of democracy, right? But there could be a situation where the city manager had to do something in this room or something had occurred in this room that required it to be secure. But that doesn't mean that you have to sign it. It just means... Right. I just want to make sure that, mm -hmm. that that's available to the city manager mm -hmm. in case of those situations and not preclude that so mm -hmm. we don't have to call an emergency session or meet every two weeks mm -hmm. because that that would defeat that that possibility okay all right um, I don't have I think most of my questions were already answered and I agree that um, it should come back to the it should come to the city council instead of the city manager to make the final determination on these these items um, hold us accountable for them um, other than that is there anything else just to make it clear that for the clerk, particularly in the minutes, the motion is to approve the ordinance as a, as amended. Amended, correct. All right. That's the, the changes to section two, just to clarify, correct? Correct. All right. We have a motion. We have a second. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. All right. We're on to item 11. Um, this is uh, resolution number 3867-20. Um, it's a second amendment to the fourth amended and restated substantial deviation uh, development order for the Oviedo Marketplace Development of Regional Impact, DRI. Um, Mr. Cobb, will you please provide a brief introduction? Uh, yes, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, this is a request to approve the second amendment to the fourth amended and restated substantial deviation development order for the Oviedo Marketplace Development of Regional Impact. From now on, I'm going to say it's the second amendment and it's a DRI. That's what DRI means, Development of Regional Impact. And the Oviedo Marketplace goes back a long time. Uh, the reason it's a Development of Regional Impact is because it covers Oviedo, Seminole County, and Winter Springs. So it's a multi-jurisdictional project. Uh, this proposal affects the mall property which you'll hear me say parcel 12. That's because the mall property is noted as parcel 12 um, in the DRI. The proposed second amendment affects the parcel 12. It's proposed to facilitate the redevelopment of the former Macy's property, which is known as track three of parcel 12. And the 
Macy's property was approved for, and this is, this is one of the important things, the, it was approved for 180,000 square feet of uh, retail services uses. This proposed uh, second amendment, it amends the development order for the DRI. It amends the land use tables to convert 51,150 square feet of retail services to 175 age-restricted multifamily dwelling units, 250 unrestricted multifamily dwelling units, and 124 hotel units, and then retain the remaining 128,850 square feet that was approved uh, as retail services. It amends the master plan for the development of regional impact to incorporate the 175 age-restricted multifamily units, the 250 unrestricted multifamily units, and then the 124 hotel units, and also retaining the remaining 128,850 square feet. It, uh, it also amends the trip equivalency matrix that's in the development of regional impact to incorporate multifamily dwellings and senior adult multifamily dwellings into the table as well as establish their rates for determining equivalency. In other words, like in this case, it was a determination that the proposed development of multifamily and hotel is equivalent to the 51,150 mm -hmm. square feet. And that was based on trips. And so you take the table and you use the rates that are provided in the table to go from one, one type of land use to another. So in this case, we went from commercial to the three age-restricted multifamily, unrestricted multifamily, and the hotels. And so this updates the table to include those. Uh, the last time we updated the table was to uh, bring forward the townhomes, uh, the Isles of Oviedo development, uh, the 184 townhomes. We actually created the table, and so that's why townhomes was part of the matrix so that we could do this. Uh, the traffic impacts, as I mentioned, the traffic impacts for the proposed development is equivalent to the 51,150 square feet of uh, retail uses. So what we're saying is, is that we're reducing the commercial to offset the addition of these three new uses. And so what you end up with from a traffic impact is a net zero impact because you've done an equivalency analysis and you've, provided a, you've reduced the number of equivalent, equivalent number of trips for the proposed equivalent number of trips. Uh, the school board did review this proposal and concluded that the students generated uh, at the three concurrency services areas, and that's what we're talking about, elementary, middle, and high school, uh, can be accommodated that would be produced by this proposed development uh, without exceeding adopted level of service within the community service area and also that there would be capacity to meet the level of service as allowed by interlocal agreements. The staff, staff reviewed the proposed Second Amendment and recommends approval. The Assistant City Attorney reviewed the proposed Second Amendment and identified no concerns relative to content or accuracy. The local planning agency conducted a public hearing on December the 3rd, 2019, and their act recommended approval of the Second Amendment. It is recommended that the City Council conduct a public hearing and adopt resolution number 3867-20. All right, um, is the applicant present? Just name and address for the record. Good evening, my name is Hal Cantor. I'm with the law firm of Lowndes, Drozick, Doster, Cantor and Reed. The address is 215 North Yellow Avenue in Orlando. So I'm gonna talk about change. This project was originally approved in 1993 and to put that in context, that was 26, 27 years ago. I don't know if you know where you were on the night this was approved, but I know I where I was because I was the guy who was before the city commission at that time, city council, uh, uh, requesting approval. Matter of fact, I think that Mr. Groot was the Seminole County attorney at the time, and I think Mr. Cobb was not quite here, but came probably before it was open. Uh, uh, so there's some history here, and there's been a lot of change amongst all of us. So what was 1993 like, just to give you a context? Well, Bill Clinton was inaugurated in 1993. The movie Jurassic Park came out that year. I can't believe it's that old. Beanie Babies were introduced. But what's really important, 
and it really has an impact on this project, is the Internet was two years old at that time in, in terms of being open or available to the public. And it has changed. And that changed kind of impacts what has happened to this mall. When it was originally approved in 93, it wasn't really a retail project. It was an industrial project with a hotel. But that really wasn't a marketable project at the time. And it then changed. Now, around the country, what's going on in this business, and I know you all are aware of this, but since the mid-1950s, about 1,500 regional or enclosed malls were approved or constructed. Experts now say that about a 1,000 of them are either going to be modified or die altogether. And the dominant change in these malls today is the inclusion, the two things, the inclusion of residential type uses and the reduction of uh, retail uses and changes in the retail uses. Uh, Regional malls uh, like this were based upon the concept of anchor tenants. And in fact, when this was approved, there were to be four anchor tenants. In fact, there were only three anchor tenants ever uh, involved with the, the mall. Um, so anchor stores have changed, too, for a variety of reasons, including uh, the fact that there's been mergers and including changes in demographics and also changes in shopping because uh, I don't know about y'all, but I was afraid to use Amazon originally because, gee, I was putting all that information out there. Now, I use it all the time, and I think many of us do. So that has an impact. Now, looking around in Central Florida, that's exactly what's going on here. Colonial Plaza, which some of you may or may not recall because it's kind of old, but had a great restaurant called Ronnie's there. Uh, that was the first regional mall of significance in this area to be reconstructed, and it's now different, uh, significantly different. Uh, Fashion Square is undergoing a tremendous change today with introduction of residentials a part of it. Festival Bay, which then became Artagon, which I never understood that name, and now it's called Desertland, which is not yet open, that's also changing into... Uh, uh, Bass Pro Shops is there, for those of you who may, may not know what I'm talking about. But that's also changing. Now we have Oviedo Marketplace, and Macy's uh, is no longer here. Sears is closed. Uh, and, in fact, my client, Omal Development, bought the Macy's site. That's what we're here to do today. So as uh, Brian indicated, there's the, the building that's there today is 180,000 square feet. That building will be demolished. And in its place will be three different types of uses uh, or throughout this area or throughout that parcel. It's about a 15-acre parcel. Uh, 250 market rate multifamily units, uh, 175 age-restricted units, uh, and 124-room uh, hotel. Now, this is just the first of a series of events that will come before you or a series of hearings because we have to go through a plan development um, amendment uh, of the plan development to meet your code provisions uh, when y'all have some stringent uh, uh, aesthetic type uh, requirements. Uh, all that will come after, hopefully, after this is approved tonight. So, uh, and it will be, it take time to do this, uh, uh, but this is the beginning of changing the mall to something that we believe will survive and prosper. We'll still have a significant retail component of this mall, but it will change in these respects. I'm here to answer any questions. Would appreciate it, the opportunity to respond to issues that may come up in discussion uh, and rebuttal. Uh, and I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. And there's, I don't have pictures because all this is is a chart. And it's, it's not sexy, it's not even that interesting, and it's kind of complicated, and it's the sixth, char uh, sixth change, uh, I think, of this project. But that's what we're asking for you today. All right. Thank you. Are there any questions for the applicant? No. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right, I have one um, request to speak form um, from uh, Mr. Kevin Heitz. Just please state your name and address for the record. Good evening. I'm uh, Kevin Hypes. I live at um, 1266 Bur uh, Burgundy Court in Oviedo. I'm the general manager of the Oviedo Mall. 
uh, and I'm also a, um, uh, a restaurant owner. I have a, the Muya Burgers in the uh, mall. Well, if you got that on the tape, there, it's looking up. Uh, <laughs> just, just saying, just saying. But, uh, uh, and I'm also a uh, real estate broker, um, developer. Um, been a broker for over 30 years, so uh, I've actually been pretty intimately involved in the changing of the mall over the last four or five years. I was the broker that brought in the O2B Kids, the Zoo Fitness, the uh, Oishi Steakhouse, because uh, it was pretty evident four or five years ago that with Amazon impacting retail sales, that malls had to change and evolve. And part of that evolution was to make it more of an activity center, more of a community center. Uh, so certainly bringing in fitness centers and O2B Kids, which is you know, thousands of uh, kids and restaurants, made a lot of sense. Um, the mall is... Um, uh, needs to be fixed. It needs to evolve. And uh, the Macy's parcel is huge, 15 acres. Best piece of property in the mall. But if you drive by it on 417, you see a sea of empty parking stalls and an old building. Uh, so I guess I'll add to that 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 parcel needs to really be repurposed. Uh, and I like that word because it's not knocking down trees and building new buildings. It's actually taking something that's pretty dead and converting it into something that's going to be very useful. And not only useful for the residents that live there, but useful to the mall. Uh, and that's why I'm here, because the mall has got very little traffic. Uh, it needs more traffic. And as hard as I try to get people in there, and I try to guilt them on Facebook to come and shop, <laughs> I do that on a regular basis, uh, it takes more than that. The way to repurpose that uh, that parcel and the entire mall is to make it mixed use uh, and an activity type center. And uh, the plan is to, uh, this is the first portion of that, to bring a 24-7 uh, feel to it with residents that live there. And it's certainly the 55 plus is really a first in this community. Uh, and the folks that want that type of product really do want a walkability to shopping, to retail, to restaurants, to entertainment. Uh, and uh, And that's what we're trying to create there. That location is built for density. Uh, it is totally underutilized right now. It's got three different lighted intersections. Um, it's got a, it's right on a major interchange, 417. It's in the commercial hub. Uh, and I would surmise that the majority of folks who live on this premises uh, will go to work probably to the south to Orlando or even to the north to Lake Mary. They're not going to be driving east where really we have some traffic issues in the city. Um, so I really think it's a, a great project. I'm very supportive of it as the representative of the mall, uh, also as a representative of all the retailers. There's many of the retailers are here tonight, uh, and I think they're very interested in you know this vote. Uh, and, uh, and I guess what I'll just end with is that we really look forward to seeing this mall become really what it could be. I believe it's a diamond in the rough, and I think in a few years, if this, we get past this stage and a few others, that that mall is going to be a home run. Matter of fact, I can guarantee that. <laughs> don't don't record that. I'm, I'm just. I'm just being a salesman here. So uh, anyway, uh, appreciate your time and certainly respect your guys' views on these things. And just uh, if you have any questions of me, I'd be happy to answer them. If not, I'll go sit down and be quiet. All right. Thank you, Mr. Right. All right. Um, that was only uh, the only request to speak for him. Um, is there anybody else uh, wishing to address this council at this time uh, for this item? Just please state your name and address for the record. Hey, hello, counselors. Hello, guests and community members. My name is Jim Gale, and I actually live in uh, 10360 um, Sandy Marsh Lane in Moss Park. But I am an active advocate for the mall. I also own a store there called Food Forest Abundance, and my specialty is sustainability. And to be able to repurpose something, you know, one of the core tenets of permaculture is to recycle and reuse. That mall has such amazing potential to be a, a, a paradise for people that don't have to have cars, that they can do everything they want right in here. And I wasn't asked to say any of this, but since you brought it up, I just had to express my views that recycling and reusing these malls doesn't just send a message to this mall, but it sends a message to the rest of the United States and the rest of the world that we can recycle. Otherwise, we've got a mountain of rubble. So let's turn that rubble into something useful for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Shannon? Name and address for the record again. <laughs> Katrina Shaddix, 1133 Covington Street, Oviedo. And I totally agree with this. 
um, as long as we're not tearing down trees, ruining bear habitat, or paving over wetlands, um, this is kind of a dream deal. Environmentalists like me um, love repurposing old buildings. And what he just said about sustainability, I don't know where I am tonight. This is amazing. It's an amazing place to be. I hope you all approve this. And I would hope that they would consider, you know, you mentioned, or someone mentioned the open parking lot. Uh, when I was doing a cross-country road trip with my son, we stopped. Uh, I wanted to sleep in the car the whole time. He didn't like that idea too much. But I stopped. I pulled over on the side of the road in Arizona, and there was a parking lot that had all these covers. And if you know in Florida, what do we look for when we park? We don't park the closest. I don't care about parking close. I want to park under a tree where it's shaded. So our steering wheel is in 1,000 degrees when we get in, which, by the way, they tore down all the trees in the public's parking lot. I don't know, know what that's about. But anyway, back to this. We pulled in uh, Arizona. It was like 100 degrees, and there were these covered parking spots. Great place to take a nap. But when I got closer, I noticed on top of these covered parking spots, there were solar panels. And the solar panels were creating energy for the electric car charging stations in these parking spots and creating the energy for the building, for the strip mall that it was, you know, um, providing the parking thoughts for. So if someone, maybe the developer, could consider, um, you know, putting those solar-powered covered spots, parking spots, and utilizing that parking lot to provide free energy to the mall, that would be the cherry on top of the Sunday. Then I hope you all approve. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Is there anybody else wishing to speak? Yes, sir. Name and address for the record again. You know, John Horvath, 1004 Bradford Drive, Winter Park, Florida. As I said earlier in my comments, this county had 25,000 people in 1950, and we have 40,000 living here in Oviedo. I grew up, my family was in the grove business, so I remember when a lot of this area was housing, et cetera, were orange groves. You didn't have to worry about traffic. You didn't have to worry about a lot of things. But I've watched this town grow. It's like me. I'm still John Horvath, but I'm 74 years old now, and I've seen a lot of changes. And when Mr. Cantor mentioned Ronnie's Restaurant in the old Colonial Mall, I remember the big sodas we used to get over there back in the day. So I survived that. I survived the changes. And as you develop, your building philosophy has changed. I mean, I used to attend a lot of meetings. And, oh, we can't have residential next to commercial. We can't have commercial next to retail and all that. Well, now if you look around in a lot of the areas, you see vertical, especially in Orlando, where you have either retail or commercial, a parking garage, and then a hotel or apartment. So we can't spread out like we, <clears throat> like we do, because if you do, you're not going to have water recharge areas, et cetera. And this is a good use of the of the, the property. I mean, it's been, the, been like that for years, and I look at some of these other malls and places, and, you know, we've got to do infill, and I try to spread out so much, and this would be a good infill, and people would use it, because I remember when UCF didn't even exist, so I can go back, and I was a meeting one time with Lee Constantine, I used to quote, figures of population, and he says, John, we hear it all the time. I said, yeah, because I'm talking to you. It's the people sitting behind me that need to hear this so they know where I'm coming from and not somebody that moved in 10 days ago and wants the door put up and the lock put out and nobody else coming into town. So, you know, we need to change that. And my grandson goes to O2B. He's one of the original ones that's going there, and I go there to watch him do stuff, and, it, I mean, it's been a great change for him, and I'm glad to see it, and I go to the movies there all the time, I eat in the food court all the time, so, you know, we need, we need to re-look re at things and not like we did 30 years ago, because everything changes and we have to re-look at, at things as they are and going on. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Hi, thank you. My name is Antonio Colacci. I live in Winter Garden. I'm from Europe, my accent, right? <laughs> Italian. Take this opportunity to probably represent uh, some um, of the small businesses who are in uh, the food court and in that Ovido Mall. You know, I moved over from Europe nine years ago because I believe in the American dream and I believe also 
uh, that this is really the country of opportunity. And believe me, I did it legally with my family, which is very important. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, yes, we are proud to be Americans right now. And I want just to say, um, Think also a little bit about those family who really believe in small businesses, you know, who live out of what we do basically also. And I think that I choose, even if I live in Wintergon and I drive almost an hour every day, choose the Oviedo Mall just because I heard good things about Oviedo, about that mall, six years ago when I started uh, the restaurant called Pasta and Pizza. <laughs> 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 uh, thank you. And um, But I, I really think it is very important for you guys to also Think about those families who put everything into the business that they have. And as Kevin was saying, who is doing really a great job to try to save not the mall, but to save the family who are working in the mall too. I believe that's very important too. And so I just uh, wanted to thank you guys. And I know that you guys are going to do the right decision tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Name and address for the record, please. Rick Ray, 680 Holly Springs Terrace, Oviedo. My wife and I moved here 13 years ago. Uh, we both uh, grew up in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, we have lived in Richmond, Virginia, Oklahoma City, Dallas, Austin. Uh, we've had, we have quite a perspective on different cultures within the South and the Southeast. And I've loved everywhere that we've lived. But Oviedo is just something special here. This is, this is a, a lot of times when you think about a small community, you think of people who have wagging tongues and are gossiping about everybody. But here there's a sense of community pride. And you see that in the way the city continues to develop itself intelligently and with foresight. And I appreciate the fact that in our small town, we have walking trails and running trails all over the place. I appreciate the fact that, that, uh, that Brian uh, and his team took over developing Oviedo on the park into something the whole city is proud of. It's, it's a beautiful, it's a crown jewel. And I just, I just love this community. I hear a lot of people gripe about the mall. The mall's empty. The mall's dead. You know, it's, it's easy to gripe, right? It's hard to come up with a solution. But here we have a, a mall manager who believes in our mall. He believes in our community. And he, he wants to see us do the best thing we can. It's called stewardship, right? We All of us are stewards of our community. And so here we have an opportunity to, instead of chiming in and saying, well, the poor mall, you know, it's, it's going out of business, going away with other malls. No, let's re, as it's been said today, we're going to repurpose. We're going to reimagine and re-envision the mall into a different kind of community, a different kind of place where the community can continue to be proud. So all I'm here to say is I support this, Kevin. I support all of your uh, efforts to revitalize our mall. Thank you for that, friend. Um, Oviedo can have two crown jewels, Oviedo on the Park and the Oviedo Mall. And anything we can do to accentuate our strengths and set us apart from the other communities in the area not in a sense of pride, but just because it's within our potential and our, and our opportunity to do. I wholly support it. I encourage it. And I thank you guys for your forward thinking. Uh, without destruction, without wastefulness, just uh, taking what we have and making the very best of it for the future. It's not just, and it's not just saving them all, but as been said, it's creating new opportunities for uh, demographics within our community that need to be better served. So thank you for it. I support it so much. I love living here, and I appreciate the leadership that this council has shown over the years. And I have no store and no restaurant to push. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. Anybody else? All right. We're going to close public comment. Um, what is the pleasure of council? Mr. Chairman. Madam Mayor? I move we approve resolution number 3867-20. Do we have a second? Second. We got a second. All right, Madam Mayor, you have the floor. This does not require knocking down any trees. It doesn't create any more impervious surface than already exists. Uh, this is about the best that we can hope for. And to boot, 
just to make extra sure, I asked the city attorney if this counted as a policy decision or quasi-judicial. And for you, those of you in the audience who are wondering what that is, quasi-judicial means that if the applicant uh, checks the boxes and follows the rules, the applicant wins. And his answer to that question was, it's quasi-judicial. So what this really hinges on, you know, even if I didn't like the idea, and, and I think that it, it has so many, so many positives that I actually do think that's a good idea, uh, but even if, if we did not like it, under our laws, we have to say yes. So this is just such a great opportunity to move forward. Uh, and as we do, I, I think it's interesting to, to ponder the density that this, cha that how this changes our density. So we're going from 180,000 square feet at Macy's to, uh, oh, before I begin this, I, I do need to disclose, uh, I met with the developer and the, the property owner, and my decision tonight is based solely on the, the information presented here. Uh, and one of the things that we talked about there was when converting from retail to residential, we talk about square footage when we're talking commercial. We talk about number of units when you go to residential. And I said, you know, how, how much square footage is that? And uh, it, he said about 400,000 square feet. And then we add the hotel, so we end up at 570,000 square feet, where we, originally we had 180,000. Uh, but because of the way traffic flows, it is net zero traffic. So I, I mention this mainly because as this does start to come out of the ground, which is going to be after many, many more opportunities for input here in these, these chambers, uh, there is a potential for more buildings to go back than are there right now. And I think it's important for us all to be aware of that from the beginning so nobody is surprised and to continue to remind ourselves that the traffic is the same according to all the studies. Uh, but this also does bring up an opportunity to hopefully as it's developed uh, bring in some more green spaces because as, as the traffic is the same and it is expanding, there, there are some little islands in there and I'm hoping that we can uh, perhaps in incorporate something like shaded parking spots in the solar. I love that idea. That's very cool. Um, and, and some sort of community-centered green space, uh, even rooftop gardens or something, because residential housing that's surrounded by all asphalt, that's not everybody's style of living. And it is not particularly reflective of how I think Oviedo would like to see itself going into the future. So. Um, while it is, y'all get where I'm going on that. I like the idea. Anything else? That's it for now. All right, Councilman Chudna. Uh, I also need to disclose I met with Smith the Cantor. Uh, I would, just about everything that needs to be said with the people up at the, up at the podium. Uh, I think it's a good project. I think we're purposing the mall for that. It give the residents an opportunity with them all right there, especially the over 55 with the, uh, with the movie theater, everything's in walking distance. Uh, all in all, I think it's a good project for them all. Is that it? That's it. All right. Councilman Chudnow. I'm sorry, Coun Councilman Britton. Well, it was a nice little history lesson. I was here in 1993. And... Uh, I had to look it up. 417 wasn't even built in 1993. I remember running on the bridge in 94, but I remember when the mall came, there was a race to build the Oviedo Mall, or what is now called Waterford Lakes, and there was a lot of nasty stuff going on. I think there was some lawsuits that, that uh, ended up after the delay to, to our mall. They kind of, kind of uh, lost the initiative because of that. But uh, I also remember, and I'm glad you brought that up, that that was an industrial area. And somewhere in the late 90s, we were asked to approve a Walmart at the corner of uh, four, uh, Mitchell Hammock and 426. And the LPA uh, declined to do that, and now we have a nice hospital there. So it's uh, ironic how things uh, come back and, and, and uh, can, you know, improve the city if we have a little bit of forward thinking. And that was the reason back then we we didn't approve the Walmart. So this is another way to, to jumpstart that mall. And you'll see, uh, I think you'll see the effects of what Mr. Cantor was talking about 
in other places like Waterford Lake, they're going to have to go through the same same thing. Uh, uh, but we're going to get ahead of it. We're going to be uh, the leaders instead of the followers this time. So I think it's a, it's a good project. Thank you. Council Member Smith. Thank you. Um, it was a nice history lesson. Um, I grew up here, and I remember Colonial Plaza and Ronnie's and how they had to repurpose all of that in Fashion Square after the naval base closed down. And um, so um, I um, am impressed with what has been done. I had a concern, and um, I was thinking in the mindset of an ordinary citizen, and I talked with uh, Ms. Pierre and, and Dr. Carrera about um, what would happen if the Macy's was fully up and running, what would be the effect in terms of, um, I think they call it, um, trip equivalencies and other things regarding traffic. And I uh, was assured that um, they're well under, um, I think, um, let's see, Macy's is like 100 and some odd thousand square feet, and they're only using 51,000 square feet, more or less. So um, there will be no impact um, in terms of traffic. Um, things of that sort. So I'm satisfied that um, sounds like a good project, uh, a good project and um, a good way to repurpose, a new word I learned tonight, the uh, mall and hopefully make it a crown jewel as the gentleman from Greensboro, North Carolina said. So I uh, agree with it. Thank you. So we've heard the, uh, the word repurpose and net zero traffic and um, the the other item, you know, with this mall is it's at that major intersection right by the 417 um, Mitchell Hammock Road. Um, I think it's still Mitchell Hammock or Redbug. I forget where. I think it changes at 426 maybe. 426. But uh, the uh, and and this is also going to service an area of our our community that we've been trying to um, to work on the you know the the um, older the the over 55 community and stuff. So. That's going to help with that. Um, a hotel. I mean, it's all all things that we've we've kind of had on our checklist, but we were concerned about the traffic issues, you know, in other areas. And you know, for this particular location, um, it's a net zero traffic, and it's repurposed, and it's you know, it's keeping um, keeping to that area and trying to help out all the business owners that are in the mall currently as well. So. I, I think it's a win in, in, in all directions on this, um, uh, for this. So um, that's all I had. Um, so with that, um, is there any, anything else on this from anybody? No? All right. So um, we have a motion and a second. Um, all those in favor, signify by, say, by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion carries. <laughs> All right. Mr. Chairman, yeah. uh, if, if I could suggest an alternative to clapping that we, perhaps we could all allow people to do, Jasmine. <laughs> like, going forward, I'm serious. <laughs> all right. Thank you. All righty. Moving right along. Um, we have. Oh. That's okay. She's fine. Okay. Um, that might actually be American Sign Language for applause. Mm. Is it? It really is. So. Okay. All right. Um, do we want to? Well, I guess we'll let everybody uh, clear out for a minute. <laughs> oh, the rest is going to be just as exciting, guys. <laughs> Everybody's leaving. We're going to talk about Round Lake Park. What are you doing? We'll see if that makes. Later. There's only one more item. Okay. It, it will be mentioned tonight at the end. All right, moving right along, um, we're going to go to item 13, resolution number 3872-20, amendment to Round Lake Park final design. Oh, I, I think we we're missing one still. She just went to the restroom. Okay. She went to the restroom. Yeah, we'll keep it going. Um, Mr. Cobb, can you uh, please provide a brief introduction? Yes. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, this is a request for the council to approve an amendment to the design of the Round Lake Park mural. 
Uh, on January the 7th, the Council adopted Resolution Number 3863-19, approving a final design for the mural that was recommended by the Public Arts Board. And the, the chosen ar artist was uh, Mr. Xavier Moss, if you'll remember. Mr. Moss also did the, uh, the mural at Center Lake Park. Uh, in February, uh, Mr. Moss met with the Public Arts Board, and the members discussed and supported an idea of adding additional women uh, to the mural. And that required uh, a revi a ri revising uh, the mural's design, uh, even though there was, con there was consensus of the, the Public Arts Board, um, they didn't make a formal recommendation uh, to do the, an amendment to the City Council. Uh, Mr. Moss did do some research and uh, found uh, some uh, women who have made con contributions to the history of Oviedo and was, is proposing to amend the design to incorporate um, these, uh, these, these women. Uh, Mr. Moss is here tonight to make a presentation to you. Um, I was asked if I could approve this design and I didn't feel comfortable doing it because the City Council approved the original design. And then shortly after the council approved the original design, we put it on display to the public at the Martin Luther King celebration <coughs> shortly thereafter. So I just felt like that since council approved the design and since there had been a public display, that it's only right that the city council approved the amendment. I think it's a good amendment, to be honest with you, and we do recommend approval of the resolution. But before telling Mr. Moss, yes, go ahead and do this, I felt like it was important to bring it before council and have, have the new design adopted. So I'll, Mr. Mr. Deputy Mayor, if you would just allow Mr. Moss to come up and present his, his information. Absolutely. Mr. Moss. I love the outfit. Oh, uh, yeah, I was at the mural before this, so this isn't like... So. He came from work. I, I did. <laughs> so... Um, good evening, City Council. I'm Xavier Moss. I'm of 2258 Foliage Oak Terrace, Oviedo, Florida. And so I actually have the graphics on hand of the proposed amendments to the mural. So if you could um, put up attachment one on the monitor. So this was the original design that was shown um, last Martin Luther King Jr. Day, um, the design that was unveiled to the public. So the revisions that we are or were considered back in February tend to be with the right upper portion. You see the Oviedo Citizens in Action Diamond, the one that says OCIA. Um, the two revisions are to shift that diamond upward to the left, and it will replace the diamond that was um, Black communities that were surrounding the Oviedo area, like um, Jamestown, um, some parts of Geneva. That had originally been concocted as a filler diamond because when I was doing my preliminary research, I did want to include more women, but history was a bit scant on specifics, and I was not about to just throw up a, you know, African-American female and be like, this is a generic African-American female. I thought that would be kind of offensive. And I, I knew there were women in this community who had contributed. So at the unveiling, that was when I was first able to actually engage with people and start to ask, do you know any women who you think, you know, contributed to this community, whether it be through education, economic contributions, who I could, you know, put up on this mural. The only woman I, woman I had up there is Marie Frances Jones, who was a midwife for Sanford, but she also served outlying communities like Oviedo. So she was a very important part health-wise to the African-American community. But I did want to place another woman. I just didn't have any names. So flash forward to February. I got some recommendations on names. Um, I was able to... Um, with the help of the Oviedo Historical Society, get access to a document that was all about um, the school's pre-integration in the Oviedo area dating back to the early 1800s. And I realized that teachers 
were what a lot of these women were. There wasn't a lot of opportunity outside of the classroom for them to contribute. So I thought that adding a teacher would make sense. So the teacher who I found was Gladys Holmes Smith. And she was a teacher at Oviedo Elementary, which you may now know as Jackson Heights. And um, this was, you know, prior to integration. And I thought that was, you know, coupled with the fact that it would be right next to the Oviedo Citizens in Action diamond, it would make a lot of sense to kind of tie those two historical artifacts together. So if we go to attachment three, you will see the revised version. I know the colors got a little pow, I you know, had to amp it up. So um, you see that I moved the Oviedo Citizens in Action Diamond up towards the left, and then I replaced um, where the Oviedo C Citizens in Action Diamond was with the portrait of Gladys Holmes Smith. So that is, those are the two amendments really that we had discussed in February. Um, as the artist, I'm working very hard to have this ready for January 20th. <laughs> I, we're can, trying. Can you do a twirl just so everybody can see the paint? <laughs> 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 he really is working. Designer. So, um, yeah, um, if, you know, the amendments aren't approved, I've already started painting. And <laughs> the, so, I mean, I can go back over and make it align to the design you saw prior. Just know you would be causing a lot of mental anguish. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it is what it is. Um, <laughs> that's the design. Right now I'm laying in the basil coats for everything because this surface is very porous, so it eats up a lot of paint. So I have to put down, basically, it's like a primer layer for all the colors you're seeing. I'm, I'm painting what you see, but then I'm going to have to go back just on top, like I was doing at Center Lake Park, and do all the detailing, the shading. And so with Center Lake Park, I had about six weeks. And with this one, we have about 10 days. So <laughs> <laughs> the Lord works in mysterious ways. So um, yeah, that's all I have to submit in regards to the amendments for the mural at Round Lake Park. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Moss. Do right. we even need a resolution for this? Why don't we just vote it on consensus? Well, we can, I think we've got it before, so we might as well just yeah. go yeah. ahead and uh, vote on it. We adopted the original design by resolution, so we need to do it. Okay. All right. So what is the pleasure of council? Mr. Chairman. Madam uh, Mayor. I move we approve resolution number 3872-20. Second. Okay, we got a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Um, Madam Mayor, you got the floor. I love it. And uh, Councilman Member uh, Chudnow had a great idea. We can put your outfit on eBay at the end because <laughs> now you're famous. You've done two murals in Oviedo and homegrown. <laughs> All right. Councilman Chudnow. We don't want to cause you any more anguish. <laughs> and it would be great. No pressure to be done for MLK Day. <laughs> All right, Councilman Britton. I, I was thinking this is just a waste of time. We just let you do it, but that was a nice uh, history lesson you gave us uh, on on your research. So thanks for doing that. Okay, Council Member Smith. Um, full disclosure: My Gladys Holmes Smith was my mother, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I could go on and on and on and on about her and the contributions she made. Uh, she attended the um, Little Red Schoolhouse, which is next to Antioch, and she went away to school, got her um, bachelor's, and came back to the community and, uh, and taught school um, before integration. And then after integration, she finished up at Altamont. Um, so I, um, uh, I'm excited. Thank you. Awesome. Great job. Um, yeah, I don't have I don't have any issues with this. Um, I love the mural that you painted over at Oviedo on the Park as well. Um, doing a great job, and uh, uh, like uh, Councilmember uh, Chad now said, we don't want to cause you any more mental anguish, and uh, let you uh, get get finished up for uh, MLK Day. MLK Day. Um, with that, um, uh, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 
Any opposed? Motion carries. All right, um, that concludes the resolutions. We're down to discussion items. The, uh, there's one discussion item on the agenda. It's the um, uh, committee assignments for city council members. Um, so let me move ahead. All right, we have, um, we have a few items on here. Um, I know some of them uh, were vacated by uh, the previous mayor, and I think the mayor um, isn't it, um, some of these you you by virtue of being mayor you're you're on on them on the boards already um, so um, Cal now um, I think that was is that you Keith? That, that was me that's you um, uh, I'll continue unless you want to take it over I'll take it over please. okay okay yeah, that's fine okay. all right and, and just so you know I anyone can go to those meetings they're, they're okay. publicly noticed so I may show up a few times too Okay. All right. Um, Tri County League of Cities. Is that a mayoral one? Or, or no, that's yes. the. Anyone. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we can all leave now. <laughs> New energy conservation methods at 8 o'clock. Lights go down. <laughs> all right. Um, Tri County. Um, did you still want to do that one? Unless somebody else wants it, I'll, I'll, I'll Okay. Keep. All right. Um, Seminole County Community Service Block Grant Advisory Board. Is that a? That, I, I'm, I'm you're on, on that one? one again. If someone would like to uh, take that over, that's fine. If not, I'll be more than happy to keep it. Okay. Um, please speak up if you uh, if this is something that you anybody else is interested in. Um, let's see. An alternate member to Metro Plan. Um, I don't know who the, the alternate was before. Was that Steve Hankin? It was Steve. Okay. Um, is, did anybody want to be the alternate? I'll do it. You want to do that? Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Seminole County Chamber of Commerce. I have not read their bylaws, so I don't know if I'm uh, if the mayor is on their uh, under their bylaws or if that's something else so I'd, I'd be glad to continue did, that. did you want to do that one mm -hmm. okay no, that's fine um, envision Seminole that may be a similar situation where the bylaws of the organization specify okay. but I have not well, yeah, so if, if you want to you want to do it I, I mean, I'll, give, I'll give it a go anybody have any issues okay uh, Seminole Community Alliance I don't know um, the the notes say that an Oviedo police staff member has has been helping out with that. With that one, okay. Um, all right, so we'll we'll leave it at that. Um, and then uh, Oviedo Winter Springs Chamber. I know this is one that when we got into the bylaws that you, as mayor, um, can sit on that. I've been sitting on it previously. Um, is that something you want to do? For for a year, I want to give it a try. Just okay. make sure I get it, get in tune with the organization. Perfect. All right, um, Parks and Recs Advisory Committee. Um, let's see, this is going to sunset and change to Senior Committee. Um, and uh, Mr. Britton started the Senior Committee. And yeah, I, I think, Brian, I need to still sit down with you and go over how we want to do that. Yes, sir. We do. All right. Um, Ion Committee. I've got that now, and I'll be. I'll, I'll you want to keep that. that one? Yeah. Okay. Okay, UCF Foundation Board. Um, I think that has sunsetted. They changed their, their charter, so they don't have the uh, uh, ex officio members anymore. Oh, they don't? No. Okay. All right. Um, can you check on that, Mr. Cobb, to make sure that we're not? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and let's see, Friends of Lake Jessup. Um, I know uh, uh, Deputy or Councilman Hankin was on that previously. I'll do that. You want to do that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And the last one, uh, Public Schools Facilities Planning Committee. Um, that was the mayor and a city staff member. So I don't know if that's a mayoral seat or. I don't know either, but I, I, that's, that sounds right up my alley. So All unless right. somebody else is real passionate, I'll, I'll it's give all it yours. a go. All right. All right. So um, I think we're good. Did you get all that, <laughs> Mr. Cobb? Sure did. I got it all. Perfect. All righty. 
Could we maybe do alternates for all of the, the chambers, uh, just in case somebody can't, if, if I can't make it one time, I think it's helpful to have continuity of presence at all of these different uh, business growth organizations. Did you want to? Or is there, is that, would that be weird? Does that not work? That's weird. Okay. The president <laughs> of the chamber says that's weird. Okay. <laughs> all right. I, I will do my best to be there every time. All right. All right. With that, um, that's the end of discussion items. Um, we're up to reports. Mr. Cobb. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, to wish everyone a Happy New Year and, and welcome back. And uh, just to take a little bit further on to Mr. Cantor's uh, history lesson, um, the Avito Mall was the first project that I ever worked on when I came to the city. Uh, Mr. Moon, who was the planning director at the time, called me into his office and said, gave me all the files and said, um, you've got six months to get this approved through the state and the city council or uh, you're not going to have a job anymore. <laughs> uh, three months later, I got through the state and so then he gave me sanctuary in Live Oak. Basically the same thing, same type of uh, direction. But um, the mall, um, it was, that was one of the things that I, it was, I had to learn the history of the mall. Uh, when I first came here, and uh, as my first project, and so it's something that has always been dear, dear to my heart as well. So, but uh, that's all I have, Deputy Mayor. All right, thank you, Mr. Creek. Do you have anything? Happy New Year. Happy New Year. All right. Um, okay, we're up to me. Um, the uh, we've made it through the holidays, all the uh, holiday festivities and events, and. Everything um, were, were wonderful. Uh, Drew, please thank your staff for that. And um, uh, Chief, please uh, thank all the, uh, all the firefighters that helped out with the Santa rides around town. Um, and Bobby, please cut the trees in Live Oak. <laughs> 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 um, the, uh, I think the Martin Luther, the MLK Day Parade is going to be coming up on MLK Day. Um, and I think that's the only thing that's going to be coming up between now and now and then, event-wise. Um, but thank you all, and um, Happy New Year. Um, Council Member Chud now. Uh, I've just got a couple of things. Uh, just a little update on the Boys and Girls Club. Mm -hmm. uh, it is roofed. It is gutted. Uh, working on uh, starting the uh, interior design and construction, uh, getting that constructed in the interim. Uh, Antioch Missionary Baptist Church will be holding a basically a mini boys and girls club for about 20 kids starting probably in a week or two. Uh, the uh, uh, on, um, for those who are interested uh, in helping out with the boys and girls club on Wednesday night, uh, Tzatziki's restaurant is having a spirit night, and a, uh, a percentage of the proceeds is going to the Oviedo Boys and Girls Club. Uh, from 5 till 9 o'clock. Where, where is that? Uh, Tzatziki's. Where is that? It's over Stone in... Hill. Stone Hill. Stone, Stone, Stone Hill. Hill. Oh, okay. Uh, so if you can come out and join us and uh, and help us out. Uh, and the other it's only other thing coming up is the Oviedo Police Foundation is having their golf tournament on March 6th. So always looking for sponsors and golfers. Perfect. If you'd like to do either, just get a hold of me. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Council Member Smith. Thank you. Um, last month I had a chance to do a lot of different things. On the 4th, I did go to the uh, CalNo meeting, Council of Local um, what's it called? Governments in Seminole County. And mm -hmm. one of the things that they did mention that we have a resolution for was for the um, um, census. And, um, and that's something that everybody really needs to pay attention to and be aware of. Um, one of the, Mr. Horvath brought uh, out these facts, and I thought it was really interesting uh, that, again, in, in, in 1950, Seminole County had 25,000 residents, and 2019, 462,000 residents. So I thought that was um, interesting. I attended the unveiling of Mr. Moss's uh, mural in the uh, um, uh, park, and also the Christmas tree lighting. I had a chance to go on the 10th to the Seminole County Board of County Commissioners just to see how they operate a little bit. Um, also uh, um, attended the Oviedo uh, Winter Springs luncheon on the 12th. 
and um, during the day and on the in the evening, I uh, got a chance to be um, Sanders' helper by throwing out uh, candy on the fire truck. And I did learn one lesson. Um, uh, if you're going to ride on the fire truck and you have a problem with motion sickness, you should sit facing forward, not in the back, <laughs> seat, with the seat facing to the back. Anyway, um, and on the 15th, I attended the um, um, New Bethel AME Church in Geneva for their annual Christmas on Cochrane Road, and I did a dramatic reading of the Christmas story um, from the um, Apostle uh, Luke. And that ends my report. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. And Mayor Sedek. All right. So the charter, we are a little bit behind in reviewing it. And uh, I'm hoping that, that we can maybe get consensus today to go ahead and proceed to appoint a, citizens, a citizen charter review committee so we can perhaps get that done and on the ballot by ideally August, but worst case scenario, November. Is there any consensus? Well, uh, uh, any our charter requires that this be done, uh -huh. so it, it's sort of it's not really optional at this point. Uh, so I, I, I'm asking for consensus more, so we can begin the process more than asking whether it's allowed yeah. to be done. Did, I mean, did it, we go through this a couple years ago? I thought we reviewed it. I think it's what but I'm I'm not objecting to it. I'm just surprised we're we're you know I don't want to make a decision tonight. Why don't we make it a discussion item? And, okay. and do it, at, you know, so we can think about it and what we want to do. Right. That that makes sense. So that move into a discussion item. Can we get that on the next agenda? Mm -hmm. okay. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. One time. All right. All right. Yeah. Um, and with Ms. Shaddix in the audience, I cannot resist letting you guys know that I met with Mr. Jolari uh, and Ms. Shaddix to talk about uh, how Oviedo can take the next step to become the first Bear Y city in Seminole County. Um, after having read the ordinance. Um, it's not very restrictive, but it would protect bears and it would protect humans. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that before the next meeting, uh, our next work session on Monday, there may be an opportunity to email this around so everyone can review it and get less scared of it. Because I, I thought that it was going to restrict, uh, you know, make you have to have a bear trash can, prevent you from growing edible things in your yard. And, uh, and those things just aren't, aren't how it's written. It, it, adds, it creates a lot of opportunities for choices that are still safe choices. Um, so I guess the, the request in this is, uh, could we email that around? Uh, and then perhaps at a later date, bring that back as a discussion. Well, I guess that's at the work session. We'll talk, could we talk about it then? Is that the best place to talk about whether to move in that direction? No, oh, we can. The, the thing that the thing that we're working on is we're working with the county to join the county's bear management area, and which yes, we would be the first incorporated area within the bear management area. And so, what the county staff is doing is they're working. They did a west side uh, bear management area, and so now we've asked them to work on an east side bear management area, and we've got a boundary. Uh, Mr. Mr. Kelly's been working with the uh, deputy county manager. Uh, we've established a boundary. They've got what the mayor's talking about. We have a draft ordinance for the county commission to approve. We would love for them to approve it, quite honestly. Um, and so uh, my, my uh, I went, was looking back through. That was the direction that was given to me by a prior council, go get us involved in the county's bear management program. And so that's what we were doing. That's, the, that's where we've been going, hence the draft ordinance. And... Um, so, but yes, we're more than happy. Uh, I would say the January 13th uh, work session, the focus of that, of that one particular item is the RFP for the residential garbage. And uh, I think we would probably be, be, I would think it would be better to talk about the bear management area, um, possibly at a different date. Uh, that way we can bring in Mr. Orlando from uh, Fish and Wildlife. We can bring in the folks from the county. We can and talk about what, like you said, what does that ordinance actually do and not do and try to dispel those. But uh, I really want to concentrate on that RFP on the 13th if we can. So. I, well, it, it may be enough for everybody here to know that 
the ordinance, if we join the bear management plan, it does not require us to have bear cans. And I think that's, that's the main, main inspiration from my end to, to getting everybody to think about that prior to Monday. Because uh, if we go into there and say, well, our RFP needs to require bear cans, um, as Ms. Shaddix pointed out, that may make some people resentful of the bears being here in the first place. If, if we say, hey, we're going to hike your, your prices way up, uh, to something you're not expecting, for a can that it is perhaps not necessary. Or I shouldn't say perhaps. I have, I have bear clips. I don't want to pay $250 for a bear can because my, cli my clips work just fine. Uh, so that's, that's at least out there. Uh, the, another thing that I've been kind of hoping the council would do since be before I, I left and came back, uh, talk about removing the development rights from the Twin Rivers Golf Course permanently. My understanding is that the attorney for the HOA uh, believes that the rights do not exist and never did exist. And if our, our council agrees with that, this creates an opportunity to permanently remove, to, you know, to write that down and have everybody agree, the owner agree, and the surrounding communities agree that the right to develop does not exist. Um, is that a discussion that there's consensus to have? Well, I, I guess it depends on what you mean by develop. Um, what if they wanted to replace the clubhouse? Isn't that development? Well, yeah, to come up with some guidelines that the neighbors can live with, because we've gone through this whole process, and if, if for forever we're having to go back and, and they've got to trust that three people aren't going to sell it and try to revive development rights that their attorney does not believe exist, and at one point ours, I think, did not think exists. I mean, it just creates this ongoing problem that we can just we can just get rid of it and move forward and, and you know, leave some leeway with the clubhouse or some other, you know, yeah. whatever people think seems sensible, but just this open-ended situation we're in can be improved upon, I think. I, the, the, the one concern, I think it was a concern we had back then as well, was um, tying the hands of future councils. Um, I understand. Precisely. That, well, you, well I, I understand that, but, but, but there could be some uninten unintentional consequences to, to, you know, being too restrictive for, you know, for the future councils in case they, like you said, the, the, the clubhouse or they, they need to do something else on the, on the on the greens or you know I mean there there could be a, a ton of different things that could occur in the future that that we don't really anticipate right now and if we if we make it too restrictive we're 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 this, just restricting it, our, ourselves basically. But this this is not a discussion about whether future things could be built. This is talking about what does our legal counsel say? What are the rights that exist right now? And we could in theory go and change the rights and say now that we own it we could create the rights that prior to our acquisition did not exist according to the HOA's attorney. So it, you, you get kind of what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's not like we're tying our hands to a place where we aren't already. If right now our intent is to not build 300 townhomes on there, then that is our intent. And let's go ahead and you know, just leave it, it that way. I, I really don't want to change it right now. There, there might be something come along. Like the opportunity to sell it to developers? I mean, that, that, no, that's no, the... No, that, that's not... Then, the, then can we give away that right? I mean, I, there, there are opportunities to create more assurance for not building there. No. All right. Well, I, I try, guys. <laughs> and, I, and I will probably try again. And here, here's another one that, that I've tried in the past. Historic Preservation Ordinance. It's already written... If it were voluntary, maybe people would come in, maybe people wouldn't, but it would create a framework through which people in this community, if they value the few historic structures that we have left, it would create a framework for them to go and talk to people who own historic, uh, historic properties and encourage them to consider uh, preserving them. And if people were to choose to do this, and it would be, you know, I live in an old building too, it's 140 years old, if, if we were forced to be in a historic district, we would have had to demolish it because we could not have kept up with some of the standards put up by the National Park Service. Uh, but for commercially owned buildings that are historic and open to the public, there's an opportunity to get access to a great deal of funding at the state level. And I would love to op extend that opportunity to people in our town who may choose to occupy 
historic buildings and make them open to the public by making them commercial. Uh, so if there's any consensus to, to explore this, uh, I think all of the legwork has been done and it would be easy to revive. I think we've, we've seen this before. Um, is there consensus to revisit it? Or? I think we've gone down that road, but um, I'll leave it up to the rest of you. The, uh, uh, I think the biggest concern we had was, the, uh, you know, the previous time we, we had looked at it was the volu voluntary turning into involuntary. Once, you, once you're in, you're, you're in and you can't get back out of it. So it's kind of like a, a bait and switch, it seemed like. It's we not a bait and switch. They would know ahead of time that that would be the intent. And even in Winter Park where they have a purely voluntary one, that's how the, all of the voluntary districts work. Once you enter, you can't just come in and out willy-nilly. Once you're in, you're in. Well, the, the problem would be is you come in and then the, you, know, you go to sell your property and now any future, any future owner of that property is now, now in it. Absolutely, so. but that would be a choice you would make to right. give up rights for the future. I so, don't know why we would limit the choice of people to do this thing. Right. Um, I mean, I, uh, we, we've gone down the road, you know, once before, um, but there are our new council members. Um, I mean, if you want, um, I, if, if there's consensus, um, you know, we can, you know, at least send it out and have it as a discussion item on a future meeting that, you know, a lighter meeting, um, but it, there needs to be consensus. So, um, anybody? I, I don't mind looking at the language, but I have the same concerns you do. Okay. All right. So it sounds like that there's, there's consensus to at least look at it. Mr. Cobb. Uh, if there's consensus to look at it, could I suggest, um, the mayor and I have been having discussions on and off about it. Mm -hmm. And we do have some ideas. If you would let the two of us work together to bring a product to the council for discussion and let, let the two of us uh, bring something to you. I know there was a lot of concerns with the original project, with right. the original proposal. And maybe let the two of us brainstorm about it and bring something that maybe something that would, the council could can find, find palatable. And that will accomplish what the mayor's looking for as far as the preservation of these historic buildings, mm -hmm. but then also get, not take away any type of property owner rights. Okay. That, that sounds great. Everybody okay with that? No. Yes. All right. Mary, you okay with that? That sounds fantastic. Okay. And maybe nobody will opt in, but to create the framework in the first place, I mean, that's the first step from my perspective. Uh, the next thing on my little list here is the state of the city. That's coming up in March, and typically the mayor has done all the talking, and I've always thought it would be wonderful if everybody did. Could, I, could you guys wrap your brains around that? And each, each We've person, done that in the past. I, I remember when it was like that, and I really, as a, as a participant, as you know, watching it, I, I enjoyed it, you know, seeing the people switch out. Are, are you all up for it? Yeah. yeah I'm good with that. That's okay. fine. Yep. Oh, yes. thank you. I'm very excited about this. It, it'll be more more fun with us. What's the, do we have a date for that yet? It's in March. <laughs> and, and I know we've already we've, we've got already, a couple months. We, we've got we've got a hold on the cultural center. I know that it's in March. We have a hold on the cultural center. And, so, and, and I, I sent a, an email around, uh, kind of hoping that y'all would be up for this, uh, creating little segments. And I, I can't remember what categories everybody was assigned to, but if we could find that email and revive it, or, or I'll, I'll, I think I had you down for like roads or infrastructure, and then <laughs> Keith was going to talk about uh, seniors and, <laughs> and then culture over here and uh, safety. It, but I, I don't want you to feel like you're pegged into safety or anything. I'm pegged there anyway. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right. right. Well, I appreciate y'all stepping up for that. Uh, and a little bit ago, in the middle of December, um, Deputy Mayor Pollock and I attended a, an event that told us a little bit about the Conference of Mayors. And it was intriguing. So I, ha I need to turn this over because I think this created a public record when I accepted this little folder that tells us all about it. Uh, but this organization, it costs about $3,500 a year to join. And of, of the mayors that I spoke with who have joined it, each one of them has brought home more in grants directly through this organization than their dues have cost. Granted, the dues are much bigger if you're a bigger city, but we're a small city, and each person has an equal vote. 
the only way that this would make sense is if I could fully participate and go to you know go to some of their their meetings, which would be you know the next one is in Texas. Oh, well, actually, I shouldn't say that. The next one is in Washington D.C., but it, logistically, it's very complicated because it would it begins Tuesday, and that's when our meeting is. And uh, I don't think it would make sense to miss a meeting to go to a conference. Uh, but the next one is is in Texas, and I, I could figure out how to swing that. So, I guess the the question is, does that sound like an organization that could be of use to our city uh, in bringing back some funds and? helping us not reinvent the wheel. And the other aspect of this is they've got a whole team of lobbyists up in Washington, D.C. And for just $3,500 a year, we have access to all of the federal lobbyists who are permanently stationed in Washington, D.C. to talk about federal issues that relate to municipalities. And that, to me, seemed like a, a very interesting aspect of what they do. So I guess the question in this is, might you, I don't know if we need to consider whether to join this or if I ask the city manager for his, his input on how I should phrase this. Well, I, I did sit through the, uh, the presentation that uh, Buddy Dyer and, um, and the uh, president of the organization and the uh, mayor of St. Pete had all discussed. Um, of, of the mayors in Central Florida, they were the, in the Central Florida area, they were the only two of them were members of the organization. The rest of the, the mayors that were there were not members of the organization. Um, and then the, the president, I forget, he was from, from a northern city. I forget which, which city it was. Um, but it, it did seem like a, a worthwhile organization when it comes to bringing back money um, that's above and beyond the, the initial dues. Um, I, you know, I, I think, you know, at least, at least for a year to kind of kind of see what what can transpire in that organization see if we can get money back i mean i you know i think it's worth a shot um to give us more of a presence in in uh in dc i think would be great um so th that's my my uh my two cents on the, the organization well <laughs> i'm getting concerned that we're using our reports to legislate and this is again this is the first time i'm hearing about this i don't know anything about it so I'm being asked to make a decision on the consensus uh, without any information. You all, you all might have the information, but I don't. Okay. So, um, I don't know. Brian, maybe give us a refresher course on how we get discussion items through and, and, and vote on them. If it's consensus of council, uh, then you can ask that yeah. we place it on the next available agenda. Yeah, why, why don't we or okay. put it in a work, you know, in a workshop or something so that we all know what we we're talking about mm -hmm. yes, okay all right uh, and the last last thing on my list for today is uh, I got a request from somebody in, in town to consider uh, a more inclusive invocation and having attended some non-christian I'm, I'm Christian uh, but having attended some some non-christian events in the last month and a half uh, it, it gave a new perspective to me on how important that could be for our community. Uh, when you go someplace and a, a prayer or a faith sort of a thing happens that you're familiar with, that's all good and well. But when you're, you're the person who is the minority and you go someplace and things may be said in another language or in another tradition that you're not familiar with, it makes you feel differently. So... Uh, I think this would be helpful to perhaps have it, have it be citizen driven and citizen controlled. Uh, in the past, our invocation has always been Christian, and well, not always, but in recent past, it's always been given by a staff member and uh, been geared towards the Christian faith. And we we have a lot of different faith traditions represented here in Oviedo, and I, I've, I've been interested to learn about so many of them. Uh, so if that's something that we, we could maybe explore, I'd be grateful. I, I haven't felt uh, that any of the invocations over the last three, four years have been particularly one religion based. Yes, it's been given by a staff member, but I don't feel and 
I'm Jewish and I'm not offended or I don't feel weird or strange by the invocations that have been done. So I, I have no issue with it. Well, can I, can I jump in real quickly? Just remember, uh, if, if, you, if you do want to change, I think you need to have a work session to figure out exactly how you're going to go about it. But please remember, you're actually, actually the invocation occurs before the business session. Mm -hmm. It's not part of the business session. Mm -hmm. That's, a, that was that was that's, that's so, critical for it to remain that. So if yeah. uh, if well, someone wants to volunteer, I, I don't think we've ever rejected anyone who wanted to volunteer to come up. But I, okay. I'm not sure that's mm -hmm. ever happened. Yeah. If if there's somebody who's passionate about trying to create equality between churches and and coordinate all that, is that something everybody? But you do run the you, risk you, not uh, being able to control I what the person says. You, right. If you're going to talk about it, you schedule a time to talk about it. And really talk about it yeah. as opposed to not, okay. no criticism. Oh yeah, as opposed to doing what you're doing now, it's, which could result in some yes. inopportune things being said about. What yes, you're doing. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I agree. But if you're going to do it, that's fine. But just do it in an organized fashion with legal counsel talking about your issues and all that. The only thing I will say is that if you open it up, you open it up. Mm -hmm. So just like if you go to the Florida Capitol at Christmas time, okay, and you go look at the holiday decorations, there will be a decoration that's there, and I forgot what the god, it's the god of beer cans or something like that. Uh, and there is a there is a along with the menorah and along with the uh, the, the the manger scene, there's a st uh, piece of art that that. Give pays homage to the God of beer cans because it's opened up. The state opened it up for displays and is open up for everybody. All right. Well, that sounds more like a not not talk about this night, possibly a work session down the yeah. road. Why don't we, uh, from from a standpoint of uh, priority, why don't we get through the other work yeah. sessions and that we can good. we can work on it okay. later on. All right, and that's it for my end. All right. Thank sure. you for your patience. <laughs> All right. Last, um, Councilman Britton. Boy. Okay. <laughs> uh, first of all, I think there was a prayer breakfast Saturday. Did there you was. all go to it? Yes. And I apologize for not being there. I made a commitment to be out of town, and then I got the email. I guess it was Friday afternoon. So uh, I hear uh, Ben was presiding. Did he do a good job? He, he did, ben did a wonderful job. job. Good. Yeah. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, there was supposed to be a 5K run uh, back before Christmas. I know it got canceled because of weather. Did, did we have to give refunds for the registration? We did? Okay. I right, just want to make sure about that. Um, Happy New Year to everyone. I don't know who reads the Sentinel, but I read it uh, New Year's morning, and they went through every decade from 1920 through uh, 2010 and put a headline or put what the major headline was, and it was pretty interesting. Just to summarize, up to 1950 or so, the big plan was to run a canal from the coast to Orlando to build a uh, shipping yard and, and have freight, uh, a freight system out here in, in Winter Garden that was going to be the big freight center. 1960, they said, well, we need some magical thing to occur to stimulate the economy. Literally, that's what they said. 70 was, oh, the magic just happened. It's called Walt Disney World. <laughs> And in 1970, said along that article, they said, on the other side of Orlando, rural Oviedo was in the middle of expanding thanks to the opening of FTU. <laughs> Who would have thunk it? 80, now this is funny, 80s, is, we're starting to grow ugly. 90s, they said, oh, we wish we were back in the 60s or 50s. 2000s, it's, uh, we're working on the problem, the growth problem like Thornton Park and Baldwin Park, but we got a ways to go. In 2010, we're still working on the problem. So uh, I think what we did tonight was work on the problem. We're, uh, we're going to infill, we're going to redevelop what we've already developed and make something better out of it. So I think we're on the right track. That's all I have. Thank you. Anything else for the good of the order? All right. All right, we're up to future meeting dates. Um, Monday, January 13th at 6.30 p.m., we have a regular session. 
Uh, I'm sorry, we have a work session at 6 p.m. Um, Tuesday, January 21st um, at 6.30 p.m. We have a regular session. Monday, February 3rd at 5.30, um, we have a CRA governing board. And after that, at 6.30, we have a regular session. And on Monday, February 17th, we have a regular session at 5.30. I'm sorry, at 6.30. Um, all those are here in the council chambers. Um, with that, anything else? We have a regular session on January 13th? No, we have a, um, no, that's, that's incorrect. On January 13th, we have a work session at um, 6 o'clock. The, the, up on the board's incorrect. Okay. Yep. Sorry. So, no worries. All right. With that, um, meeting is adjourned. <laughs>